for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Bill Randall, Johnny, and are you ever a lucky stiff? Well, coming from you, I have my doubts. How can you say that, man? Getting away from all this rain and cold, basking amidst the sweet-scented blooms of magnolia and honeysuckle? Uh Uh-huh. Where is this springtime paradise? Charleston, South Carolina. And what caught fire down there? The Ambrose Cooper Paper Company, Johnny. Burned halfway down to the ground last night. Second fire there in two years. Cost one of their secretaries their life and could cost us around a hundred grand. Well, you can afford it, even if she couldn't. Not if it's arson, we can. Well, maybe the mint juleps are in bloom down there, too. <laughs> Now for just a few words on the subject of getting things done. Within the past few years, a new plan of activity has sprung up in America, the do-it-yourself plan. Whether you want to build a better mousetrap, a house, a rocket ship, plant a garden, or have some new clothes, you can buy the plans or patterns and do it yourself, which is a good idea. But there are still many things which can be done better with advice and help from the experts. For example, if you want to know the best way to plow the land, irrigate fields, or terrace your sloping acreage, there are experts who are always at your service. The engineers who are employed by the Department of Agriculture. They are also the ones to ask for advice in constructing the buildings and potato cellars and seed beds on your farm. If you need electrical power on your farm, the department's electrical engineers will give you the help you need. Perhaps you may want to know the best way to can vegetables, what special shoe to buy, or how to plan the right kind of meal. If you do, the Bureau of Home Economics issues booklets on almost everything that goes into a home. If you want to set up a practical bookkeeping or accounting system to help budget and control your farm expenditure, the Department of Agriculture will help you work out the system which is best for you. It will also give farmers advice on financial matters, even help with cash loans, and help the farmer establish prices for his product, which are fair to both him and the buyer. All in all, the Department of Agriculture is a right neighborly organization to deal with, and an important part of your United States government. account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Eastern Fire and Casualty Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the magnolia and honeysuckle matter. Expense account item one, $53.40. Airfare and incidentals between Hartford and Charleston, where I checked into the Colonial Hotel. Expense account item two, $50, rental of a cream-colored convertible which I drove down to police headquarters. Lieutenant Hervey of their arson division was working at the scene of the fire, so I went over to see how he was making out. It's only been a couple of hours since it cooled down enough to dig into Dollar, but you sure didn't make the trip down here for nothing. You figure it was torched? No huh? question about it. Come on over here. Yeah, sure. This is where the offices were. The plant itself was back over there. Damage isn't too bad back there, but she sure got hotted up in a hurry out front here. Mm-hmm. Looks like this was a private office of some kind. It was. Norman Cooper. The insurance policy shows that Mrs. Alice Cooper is sole owner of the outfit. That's right. Norman's her son. Oh. There's another Cooper who works for the outfit, too. Robert. Younger brother of old Ambrose Cooper, who died about a year ago. In uh, that other fire. Yeah. But here's what I want to show you. Take a look at that floor. Uh-huh. Deep charring flaring out from the center. Yeah. Probably some highly inflammable liquid. Kerosene, gasoline, something like that. Amateur job, too. No professional bug would leave a trail that plainly marked. Who turned in the alarm? Night watchman. He was at the far end of the plant making his round when it broke out. By the time he got here, there wasn't anything for him to do but pull the bar. Was clocked in at 4.17 a.m. Where's he now? Over General Hospital, getting some burns doctored up. 
He got him trying to pull the girl out. What about that girl? Name's Felicia Farrell. Norman Cooper's secretary. She was lying on the floor right over there. The fire killer? They're posting her now. Coroner should let us know in a couple of hours. Well, it doesn't make much sense, does it, Lieutenant? Not true, far. Name of your torch. Yeah. The fire girl being down here at four in the morning, uh, Norman Cooper might be able to clear it up for us, though. Yeah? How's that? He took the fire girl out last night. Well, what's he got to say about it? We don't know. I haven't been able to find him since. There was nothing more I could do at the scene of the fire, so I went to pay my respects to our policyholder, Mrs. Alice Cooper, whom I found silver-haired and gracious, serving tea in her mansion on Laguerre Street. She fitted perfectly into a picture of the old South. Her brother-in-law, Robert Cooper, was also present. He struck a more discordant note. It was so nice of you, Mr. Dollar, to find time from your pressing duty to come calling on us. Actually, I should think that the interest of Mr. Dollar's insurance company would be more properly served in some other way. Just what did you have in mind, Mr. Cooper? From what Lieutenant Herbert tells us, there's definite suspicion that the fire was deliberately set. Your time might better be spent among the criminal elements of Charleston rather than here. Now, really, Robert, I'm sure that Mr. Dollar is a more qualified judge than either of us as to what procedures he must follow. Some tea, Mr. Dollar? <clears throat> no, thanks, Mrs. Cooper. Robert? If you please, Alice. I, I presume one of the first things you'd like to know, Mr. Dollar, is the present whereabouts of my son, Norman. Do you know where he is, Mrs. Cooper? He's away on a hunting trip, Mr. Dollar. He left last night, around midnight. Norman loves to go hunting. It's his favorite sport, you know. He'll be back in a few days to answer any questions you might have. Uh-huh. Isn't midnight a rather unusual hour to leave on a hunting trip? No, look here, Dollar. I strongly resent the implications in this line of questioning you're pursuing. I imagine Felicia Farrow strongly resents the fact that she's dead, too. Norman had nothing to do with that. Or with the fire. Oh. Of course he didn't, Robert. But Mr. Dollar is certainly entitled to the information he desires. Uh, Mr. Dollar, midnight's the time Norman prefers to leave on his trips. That way he arrives at the hunting preserve at dawn. He always says it's the best time for shooting. Mm Mm-hmm. I understand he had a date with Felicia Farrell last night, Mrs. Cooper. Uh, Yes, that's right. It took her to a company dance at the country club. It, It was over at 11. He brought her back home and... Then left on the trip. Just how friendly were your son and Felicia Farrell? Why? I'll answer that, Ellis. Uh, and I'll put it bluntly, Mr. Donner. Felicia Farrell was extremely attractive, but hardly the kind of girl Norman would consider marrying. And so far as I know, there's still no law against the sowing of a few wild oats. There is if a harvest turns out to be murder. Oh. Ellis. Uh, I'm sorry. That was terribly clumsy of me. I... Are there any more questions, Mr. Dollar? Not now, Mrs. Cooper. And thanks. Back at the paper factory, I learned that Lieutenant Hervey had returned to police headquarters. So I went to a lunchroom across the street to call into him. Expense account item three, 55 cents. Phone call, hamburger, rare, and a cup of coffee. Hey, uh, mister, one hand bigger with the works. I figure it's done the way you wanted it. Oh, it looks fine. And that was coffee you said you wanted with it, isn't That's it? That's right. Uh, uh, yeah, there's sugar and cream. No, black. Oh, I see, sure. Thank you. See, that sure was a mighty big fire they had across the street last night. Yeah, I guess it was. Yeah, kind of run into bad luck with fires, the Ambrose Cooper folks. <laughs> the second one in two years they had. Uh-huh. Eh, my, it was real pretty, though, it was, though. Much prettier than the first one. Old man Cooper himself got burned to death in that one, you know. He... You saw the fire last night? Oh, yes, I... Oh, it was real pretty. The <laughs> place sure looks like a mess now, though. How did you happen to be around at four in the morning? Well, the night man was sick, and the boss made me take his turn. Oh, he's always doing that, the boss. He kind of makes the fellow mad, too, having to take another fellow's turn like right? Yeah, yeah. Did you uh, see anybody around the place last night? Well, no, there wasn't nobody around that I seen. Of course, everything. Oh, there's nobody but old Horace, that he is. Horace? The old Who's Horace he? Singleton. <laughs> and the night watchman over there. Oh, it's no wonder they're always getting fires with old Horace around. Yeah, why is that? 
You would never need to ask that question, Mr. <laughs> if you'd seen him the way he was in here last night. He came into the restaurant last night? Oh, yes, he always does. He gets to nipping at that bottle of his, and then somewhere around three or four in the morning, he begins to feel like having a little bit of company. So he'd been nipping last night, too. <laughs> nipping? Man, he was drunker than 40 hoot hours. Oh, he was real happy. <laughs> real happy, old Horace was. Said he was kind of celebrating his retirement. What time was that? Well, let me see. That was maybe 10, 15 minutes before the fire broke out. But I never figured old Horace would be rich enough to retire, though. I always thought every, every extra cent he made went for booze. How come you didn't tell the police all this? Well, I don't know. Well, I never thought about that again. You think maybe I ought to tell them something about that? They ought to know something about that, huh? Well, they might be interested. I relayed the information to Lieutenant Hervey at headquarters, and he checked with General Hospital. The watchman, Horace Singleton, had been treated for superficial burns and discharged an hour before. We started out in Hervey's car to see if we could pick him up for questioning at his home. It might make some sense, though. We figured Singleton might be suspect in that other fire when Ambrose Cooper died. Never could dig up any proof against him, though. Huh. Can't figure out this crack about his retirement. The old Cooper's dead broke, so far as we know. This is his street here. Charles is not very proud of this neighborhood with all these shanties and shacks. That shack in the middle of the next block. Is that where he lives? That's the place, the one with... Dollar! Yeah, looks like we're just in time to pull the box on a third fire. By the time we got there and broke down the locked front door, the fire was really getting underway. Right in the middle of it was a rickety iron cot, and in the middle of the cot was the body of Horace Singleton. An empty whiskey bottle was still clasped firmly in his hand. Get that over there, to get him outside just as the first pumper rolled up in answer to some neighbor's call. Uh, uh, well, dear Della, I didn't think we were going to make it. Well, uh, we could have saved ourselves the trouble. Yeah. He's not going to answer any questions for us now. Well, he answered once. How's that? Whatever else he might have done, he didn't set that third fire. Not even the worst corn liquor smells like raw gasoline. around just long enough for the coroner's man to come out and pick up Horace Singleton's body and then went back to headquarters. Looks like we're in kind of a rut, Dollar. Three fires, three bodies. And we're getting nowhere fast. Well, at least we've got a pretty classic arson pattern. Yeah. The use of fire to destroy the evidence of another crime. Uh, this ties in, too. The coroner's report on Felicia Farrell. Lung tissue not seared or burned. Definite evidence of oxygen starvation. Probable cause of death, asphyxiation prior to exposure to fire. And I'll give you eight to five right now. We get the same type report on Horace Ingram. So we've got a pattern. I know. Still doesn't tell us who or why. I sure like to... Excuse me. Tim, hurry. Here? Where? Uh-huh. Did you search a car? Yeah, I got it. Bring them down here to headquarters. I'll be waiting. Thanks. Well, that might help clear up a few points, Don. Young Norman Cooper was just picked up by the highway patrol for speeding. Did they happen to find some hunting equipment in his car? Yeah. Some other things, too. Like what? Felicia Farrell's handbag and a couple of empty gasoline cans. <laughs> You know many great men have attained the highest office in our land, the presidency of the United States. Can you guess the name of this man? He has been called a lawyer by profession, a fighter by choice, and a politician by force of circumstance. And he was outstanding in all three fields. In 1788, at the age of 21, he was appointed public prosecutor for the region which is now Tennessee. As president, 
He was the first to introduce the national convention for the nomination of presidential candidates. During his campaign for the presidency, his opponents attempted to smear him by an unwarranted attack on his wife, Rachel, who never recovered from the ordeal and died just before her husband's inauguration. If you don't have his name by now, here's one more clue. During the Battle of New Orleans, as Major General of the Army, he accepted the help of the pirate Jean Lafitte. Who was he? Andrew Jackson, 7th President of the United States. His life is part of your American heritage. And now with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. It took about 45 minutes for the highway patrol to bring Norman Cooper down to headquarters. When we sat down with him in Lieutenant Hervey's office to talk things over, he didn't seem too upset at the prospect. I caught the news on the radio up in Marlboro County, turned right around, head back home. That's why I was speeding. You sure that's all you know about it, Mr. Cooper? Of course it is, Lieutenant. How could I know anything else? You had a date with the police of last night. What time did you bring her home? Why, somewhere around 11.30, quarter of 12, must have been around there. I was ready to shove off for my trip at midnight. Anybody see you bring her home? Why, no, not that I know of. I just dropped her off at her apartment and drove on home. No, I don't think any... Say, what is this? Are you trying to accuse me of having something to do with that fire and Felicia Farrow dying? We're just trying to get some information, Mr. Cooper. Well, I don't like the way you're going about it, Lieutenant, holding me down here, questioning me this way. I think I've got an explanation coming. Maybe you'd better explain how come Felicia's handbag was found in your car. She left it there. Forgot it when she got out. Did she forget those empty gasoline cans, too? Gasoline cans? What have they got to do with this? Mind telling us what they were doing in your car, Mr. Cooper? No, I always carry extra gas along with me in case I run out on the road. That's what happened this time. Look, you're just trying to build up a great big thing out of nothing. Why should I want to kill Felicia? Well, I hardly knew the girl. She worked as your secretary. You took her out dancing last night? Sure I did, to a company dance. It was the only date we ever had. The only reason I took her was a girl I usually go with stood me up. Who's that, Miss Cooper? Oh, her name's Marianne James. Lives at 611 Crescent Drive. She's the girl I've been going with. She can back up what I'm telling you. Now, we'll check with her. How come you thought I was Felicia's boyfriend anyhow? Didn't the fellow was really taking her out square your way on there? Who are you talking about, Cooper? Well, the man my mother's going to marry. My uncle, Robert Cooper. While Norman Cooper was giving his statement to the police stenographer, Hervey made a few calls around town trying to locate Robert Cooper. He came up with nothing, so I drove to Mary Ann James' address. Nobody was home at 611 Crescent Drive, but a gossipy neighbor informed me that Mary Ann James worked as a hostess and guide at the Botanical Gardens, 15 miles north of town on U.S. Highway 52. Expense account item four, $1.50, entrance fee to the garden. According to the modest sign out front, I was entering 250 acres of the most lush and beautiful flora to be found in South Carolina. Mary Ann was one of ten southern bells whose job it was to paddle enraptured tourists around artificial canals in flat-bottom boats while intoning the glories of nature to be found there. I waited until her boat was free, then stepped aboard and we pushed off. You'll notice over there on the left bank, sir, the border of azalea, for which the botanical gardens are justifiably famous. There are over 47 different varieties of these lovely, delicate blooms, ranging all the way from the purest of virginal white to the deepest shade of passionate red. Okay. Straight... Okay, Marianne. You can relax now. I beg your pardon, sir. We're out of sight of the dock. Suppose we talk about something more interesting for a change. The rules of the garden, sir, forbid us girls to enter into any personal conversation with the visitors here. It must get pretty boring. Oh, you don't know the half of it. I get so sick of azaleas and magnolias and honeysuckle at times, I could just... Say, now, wait a minute. You're not one of those company spies, are you? No, not this time. My name is Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. I can't say I rightly know what that means, Mr. Dollar. 
Well, boiled down, it means I'd like to ask you a few questions about Felicia Farrell. Felicia Farrell? I don't think I rightly know anyone named... Oh. Now, you're not talking about that poor girl who got herself burned to death in that fire last night. Yeah, that's the one. I read about that in the papers this morning. That poor, dear thing. What a perfectly nasty way to die. But I'm afraid all I know about her is what I read in the papers, Mr. Dollar. That's not what Norman Cooper says. Norman? Did he say I knew anything about Felicia Fair? That was my general impression, yes. He's just a darling old thing, Norman is, but he sometimes gets the craziest ideas. A poor girl like me working out here hardly gets a chance to meet anyone. Oh, is that so? I should say it is. After all, a girl needs clothes to go out and meet people, you know. And you can't possibly imagine what perfectly miserable salaries they pay us here. Yeah, I think I can. Well, what do you know? Looks like somebody dropped some money in the boat. Now, did one of those careless visitors here do that? I swear, some people would lose their heads if they weren't fastened on. Yeah. If you'll give me that bill, Mr. Dollar. Oh, sure. Here. Now, what were we talking about? Felicia Farrell. Oh, yes. The poor dear girl. Of course I knew her. But it was I think enough to say I didn't. You know where she was last night? I ought to. Oh? Why is that? I had a date to go to the company dance with Norman, but the last minute I got a silly old headache. I didn't want to spoil Norman's fun, so I asked Felicia to go with him instead. Has she ever gone out with him before? With Norman? Why, oh, hardly. He's been escorting me around for the past year or so. Who did she go out with? Felicia. I don't know one in particular. Well, what about Robert Cooper, Norman's uncle? I heard Felicia talk about him once or twice, but that's all. I know for certain she never went out with him. Well, Norman said she'd been going out regularly with his uncle. He did? That's right. You know, that's very embarrassing, Mr. Dollar. Oh? Why? Well, Norman's such a darling old thing. I sure hate to get him to any trouble. But it stands to reason that one of us is lying. And I sure know it isn't me. <laughs> After floating around the gardens for 30 minutes more without Mary Ann changing her story, I headed back to town in the Colonial Hotel. There was a message from Lieutenant Hervey asking me to call him at headquarters the minute I got in. Been checking the bank accounts of the people involved, Dollar, and it looks like it's paying off. Well, it's about time something did. Felicia Farrah made a cash deposit of $500 over and above her salary checks each and every month for the past two years. What about Norman's account and Mrs. Cooper's? Nothing there. But Robert Cooper's account shows a correspondent cash withdrawal of $500 two to four days before each of Felicia's deposits. Have you picked them up yet? No, but we will. And it's not too tough to figure now. Well, a blackmail motive might be a little hard to prove without knowing what Felicia had on him. Felicia Farrell has a safety deposit box in the same bank. Can you get a court order to open it? We're getting one now. Care to join us? I don't mind if I do. We found that the safety deposit box was held jointly by Felicia and Mary Ann James. The vault records showed that Mary Ann had been in to open the box earlier that same day. And the box contained a marriage license, issued a year before to Felicia Farrell and Robert Cooper. You can't ask for a better blackmail motive, dog. Robert wanted to marry Mrs. Alice Cooper while he's already secretly married to Felicia. She really had him over a barrel. No wonder he killed her. Yeah. The death of the watchman makes sense now, too. Sure. He must have stumbled into it while Robert was killing her. And figured he could do a little blackmailing, too. Well, it looks like two down and one to go. Uh, what? Somebody else could have the same idea. Marianne James? The license isn't proof of marriage, but a certificate would be. And she was into this box for something today. If she figures on... Trying the same thing, Dollar. And uh, Robert Cooper follows the same pattern. That's just what I was thinking. A phone call to the Botanical Gardens brought no answer. It was after 5.30 and the place was obviously closed. There was only one place left to go. 611 Crescent Drive. 
Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Mr. Dollar. Uh, what are you doing here, Norman? Well, I'm waiting for Marianne to get home. You see, we... Do you mind if we come in? Why, no, not at all. Thanks. Miss James hasn't come home yet? No. Now, I've been expecting her. She's usually home about this time. We had a date, but she phoned said she'd be a little late. Did she say why? Yeah, she said she had to meet someone at the gardens after closing time. Some kind of a business deal or something. Why, did you want to see her about something important? You could call it that. We covered the 15 miles out to the botanical gardens in something like 11 minutes flat. The place was dark and deserted looking except for two cars in the parking lot. The hood of one of the cars was still warm. And it was registered to Robert Cooper. He's in there with a dollar. No question about it. Where? I don't know. But with 250 acres to cover, we better get started. We split up and headed into a night blackened mass of tropical foliage. There didn't seem to be a prayer of finding anyone in there. But I figured that 47 different varieties of azaleas was as good a place to start as any. But it didn't look as if I was right. Clump of magnolias. Get away from here. Get out. Dollar. I don't know. Cooper. Throw your gun out, Cooper. Yeah. I see it. What about the girl, Dollar? She seems all right. Passed out with shock. She shouldn't have tried it. Blackmailing me. Refusing to let me go. It wasn't my fault. Nothing else I could do. There's no crime worse than blackmail. Felicia Farrell could think of one. Expense account item five, eighteen dollars and thirty cents. Hotel bill and miscellaneous. Expense account item six, fifty-two dollars and seventy cents. Airfare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, one hundred seventy-six dollars and forty-five cents. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Uh-huh.